Welcome to the IRT program episode 5 congenital rickets Dr Kiran K Nandivada sir can you educate us all how the maternal factors result in congenital rickets please what we see inside the womb and what happens in outside the womb may be similar but the causes are much different like we know the maternal causes if the mother is weak how can you expect the child or the fetus to be strong the mother is letting the fetus grow into a baby as the embryo grows how is the nourishment coming nourishment is coming as the small embryo is in a yolk sac it is inside the endometrium trying to go it is called as fetal milk what is it called fetal milk which nourishes the initial weeks of the developing embryo into the fetus once it is 6 to 7 weeks later then the placenta takes control like like a tree sending in roots into the mother earth into the endometrium the placenta will deeply get attached and then the mother placenta baby that circulation starts placental barrier starts getting set up where the nutrition goes oxygen goes anything abnormal fetus gets affected so at this stage i would like to just stop and talk about preventive orthopedics what is preventive orthopedics i will say prevent a problem rather than treat a problem here i say maternal mortality rate or maternal morbidity if they are taken care of fetal morbidity and fetal mortality will come down so what is preventable at least let us try to prevent that's where in the world you know when a world scenario you see unicef they reach out to all the expectant mothers even uh, young ladies who are even unmarried or just married they concentrate on their protein and vitamin uh, supplementation before marriage after marriage prenatal antenatal postnatal so they supplement vitamin d calcium to sufficient levels so there's something called as a stos therapy s t o s s therapy see these are all found when you start asking questions when you start referring and researching one book one textbook will not give the full answer you have to make the answer for yourself and then that's the way you get a gold medal that's the way you get a distinction that's the way you just zoom into your post graduation super specialties and a beautiful life ahead about stoss therapy i'm going to show you the slide it's very important to go into the embryonic uh, development of the bone till 6 to 7 weeks it is mostly in the membranous or fibrous stage after 6 to 7 weeks what happens is the cranial neural crest cells form the bones of the skull except the occipital and the temporal bones it forms other skull bones and also forms the clavicle then you have the somites which form the axial bones lateral plate mesoderm forms the long bones you have to go into the embryology how does the bone mineralize in the intramembranous ossification which is a direct ossification direct formation of the osteoid and the calcium and minerals come and it is calcified which is seen in the flat bones of the body intramembranous ossification takes place as five steps first the mesenchymal cells differentiate forming the osteoblasts osteoblasts become the ossification center the osteoblasts secrete a material called osteoid in which they get entrapped and then they are forced to transform to osteocyte once osteocytes are formed then you have the trabecular bone formation periosteal uh, covering formation cortical bone forms superficially then we have blood vessels going and penetrating into the lumen of the bone forming the red bone marrow intramembranous ossification now we have endochondral ossification here also there are five steps see intramembranous ossification could be a short notes endochondral ossification could be a short notes just remember both of them have five steps each intramembranous directly forms into the bone in endochondral ossification five steps again the mesenchyme will differentiate and they form into a cartilaginous model and uh, this model next stage will be multiply hypertrophy and alter the content of the matrix again they also will secrete a matrix which enables mineralization in intra membranous ossification the osteoblasts secreted an osteoid into which they got stuck got transformed into osteocytes and the flat bones are formed 
in endochondral ossification the cartilage model secretes a matrix which invites mineralization next stage is chondrocytes undergo self inactivation or death so that new blood vessels can come bringing along osteogenic cells now once osteogenic cells come primary ossification is formed in the diaphyseal region in the periosteal collar it's called as periosteal collar secondary ossification centers develop in the epiphysis region after birth the primary ossification center usually is the present before birth or during birth very rarely you can have after birth but secondary ossification center are is always formed after birth this is a medical legal importance in detecting a fetal mortality a scenario when the post mortem is done here i would like to point out to a study done by cohen they studied this sudic sudden unexpected death in infancy and childhood sudic cohen et al in 41 cases of these post mortem findings they said radiology reveals changes of congenital rickets in only 19% because 30% of the bone must be altered before radiological it is seen histology reveals uh, some change of rickets in the especially in the ribs when the rib is being biopsied or taken out 69% of the ribs show low vitamin d resultant rickets and changes which had affected other organs as well isn't it this is a very important point if you can remember during exams it's very important histology is more important than radiology in the newborn which has suddenly died due to low vitamin d you write this point a very important point i would like to tell you 80% of mineralization occurs during the last trimester of pregnancy see how much you must monitor see how much you must educate the patient one more pearl i would like to share with you before 6 months after the baby is born if there is rickets developing it is due to maternal causes of low vitamin d of low vitamin d if it is after 6 months it can be due to vitamin d calcium deficiency phosphate deficiency please remember this and mention it in your notes during the exams now i proceed to the structure of the epiphysis i would like to make your life a little easy intramembranous ossification five steps endochondral ossification five steps epiphyseal growth plate has five layers first zone of the epiphysis is lipids uh, proteoglycans and glycogen second layer is a proliferative zone this is just becoming active and that contributes to the long channel growth which zone in the epiphysis is affected in rickets hypertrophic zone proliferative zone resting zone or primary spongiosa or secondary spongiosa you have to tick hypertrophic zone why the chondrocytes self destruction to welcome blood vessels so that osteo uh, genic cells come that process of self destruction is defective so there is a cartilaginous model and there is it is an uh, osteoid which is not mineralized so there is no strength but there is layer there is separation the increase but no strength what will happen if you uh, put book over book or book over book and after certain stage you try to pick it up all the books will fall down so you you are increasing the layer by a metabolic or a genetic problem and not able to mineralize it this is the problem so the zones in the epiphyseal growth plate are resting zone proliferative zone hypertrophic zone primary spongiosa secondary spongiosa fifth zone now with this let me proceed to the genetic aspects of a congenital rickets case from the mother to the baby it can be an autosomal recessive transmission dominant transmission now i have some irt members in your medical years and now in 
Has a record story ever changed? Doctor, what is the role of genetic screening and genetic engineering in screening for congenital rickets? The genetics also, science also changes. There will be a lot of change. That's how we are able to reach to the dark side of the moon. Similarly, in genetics also, same. Now coming to Tessa Amin Thomas, wonderful question. Fex mutations were observed in the most common causative gene XLDHR and that causes the most common genetic cause of hereditary rickets. Then they grouped it into FGF23 dependent hereditary rickets, FGF23 independent rickets and they made some again some targeting therapy, gene therapy, they targeted certain gene points. Uh, I have to read it. NVP dash BGJ three nine eight and KRN twenty three. So they are focusing on them, and they said lot of recovery is there in FGF twenty three mediated hereditary rickets, and further results are awaited. This is from an article published in two thousand seventeen, seven years ago, seven years ago. So now, what is happening currently? This is the answer for you. So much is changing. compared to my times what are the features of congenital rickets so basically infants born to mothers with vitamin d deficiency we often see symptoms like softening of the skull results known as cranial tabs white skull sutures wide breast enlargement and even convulsions uh, in some cases rickets is suspected before birth and based and is based off on antenatal x-rays uh, historically rickets was quite common due to inadequate vitamin d especially in the industrialized nations up until the mid 20th century Uh, another important development sign in infants is the closure of the anterior fontanel. Uh, normally, the soft spot closes between four and twenty-six months, and when it remains open longer, it could be a signal of increased intracranial pressure, hypothyroidism, or skeletal anomalies, conditions that require for further evaluation. Lastly, how a Harrison sulcus is formed? Um, so it is a groove along the lower rib cage and is often caused by abnormal diaphragm contractions in infancy. These contractions create negative pressure which deforms the chest wall while it's still soft leading to this a uh, characteristic adentation. Uh, so it's basically important to monitor these developments closely to ensure proper diagnosis and treatment. These members are so enthusiastic I really hats off to all of you. Now to summarize congenital rickets due to maternal causes of nutritional uh, deficiency of vitamin D it can be of multiple vitamins also like vitamin C and iron deficiency we never know all these things lead to a weak baby and weak immunity and compounded with a uh, low vitamin D can lead even to intrauterine growth retardation what still births to three they can have fractures inside the uterus or they may develop deformities right inside the uterus even before they are born delayed uh, body call embryonic milestones you will have every stage you have one process going on they will get delayed so it may even affect the intellectual ability of the newborn laryngeal spasm strider when they are born preterm uh, births a very very low apgar score Rickets, uh, rackety rosary, and uh, Harrison sulcus. Here, Harrison sulcus. I would like to say, in 1932, Johnston had his own beautiful description of Harrison sulcus. We always say it's the diaphragm. It's a diaphragm pull which produces negative intrathoracic pressure, causing the Harrison sulcus on a soft the rib cartilage and the bones. But here, there also is one more thing. They say the upper ribs are moving upward. and forward the lower ribs are moving backwards and downwards that is why this parity of rib movements and the softness and the powerful pull of the diaphragm cause harrison sulcus that is the complete answer they may develop osteopenia osteoporosis just imagine they are born with osteoporosis see the implications in their future incomplete fractures can exist sabar shaped tibia the pull of the uh, tendo eclis on the soft tibia produces anterior kyphosis sabar shin tibia they may be scurvy existent even in a neonat so other factors like hypothyroidism must all be ruled out whenever you have any abnormal child thank you see you again part 2